uh, we kind of get the theme of this chapter from the very first verse there. The Bible says, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. And pretty much the rest of this chapter is going on about this commandment for the priests. And basically God's disgust with the priests and their total failure. And, you know, even going into chapter 3, it's, it's directed at kind of all of Israel, Judah, but it's, it's still specific on a lot of the, the spiritual leadership and the priests. You know, the priests at the time, priests weren't just, um, what, you know, while they were absolutely responsible for um, the, you know, performing sacrifices and, and, and a lot of the things that are laid out in the law, they were also supposed to be spiritual leadership as well and teachers of the law and, and looked up to for showing the right ways of God and just knowing the law really well and being able to teach and instruct and guide. So um, that is not what, uh, because of that position, it's a big deal when they, when they fall, when they fail, when they start um, corrupting the word of God. And we're going to see here, it's kind of this is big uh, rebuke to the priests, especially in this chapter. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. And, you know, when it comes to just the position of, obviously we don't have priests today. We don't have the Levitical priesthood. The Bible, we, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. So every believer in God's eyes has, has a, a, a special standing with God. But if we kind of look at the, the New Testament offices for the local church and compare that to the Old Testament, you look at pastors, teachers, you know, people are in this position within the church are very similar to the priests. And I think if we're going to look at some application today, we need to be looking at the spiritual leadership in today's churches. And I think people need to be looking at this clearly. And, and you know, for anyone who ever has a desire, the Bible says if, you know, that he that desireth to be a bishop, he desireth a good work. You know, if you want to be a pastor, you want to be a bishop, you want to be an elder, that is a good thing. That's a good desire. But people need to take the job seriously and have enough uh, integrity and care for the word of God when you get into these things. And it, it's really mind boggling because there's, so, there's some people who get into jobs like this, into, into spiritual leadership jobs, thinking that they're going to like, it's just this easy job and they're going to make this money and it's just, they don't have to do much. And some people are like that. There's some, some wicked people out there that want to get into running a church and and they just kind of think like man it'll be so easy i only have to work one day a week and i could you know wh do whatever i want to do and it's extremely wicked but the, pro the 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 huge problem with this is you know it's one thing if you go off into the secular world and want to have that type of attitude and try to find the easiest job you can it pays really well but like you're literally working for god I mean, you, you are that under shepherd who's working for the great shepherd. I mean, you are in that position that's supposed to be someone who's helping to expound the word of God, expound on the law of God, help people understand and preach righteousness and truth. And if you come out with that attitude, you have no one to answer to but God himself. And, and that ought to be a scary enough concept for anybody ever wanting to even take on some type of title or role of being in that position. And too many people don't have the proper fear of God. You know, and, and everyone, anyone even thinking this, don't forget that and remember that. And you need to remember that all the way through. And people who like to curse, uh, you know, the new IFB because of their stand on homosexuality and stuff, it's like, who do you work for? Um, the judgment on the word of God to say, hey, look, I have integrity. I care about God's word. I care about what it says, so I'm going to preach all of it. Because that is what's being done. Regardless of people trying to say, hey, there's a, oh, you just hate people who are different from you, or you just are, are so full of hate and everything. It's like, look, you you're repeating, and too many good people, and when I say good, I mean saved, even, you know, saved pastors who are falling into this boat of, like, 
bringing condemnation down upon people and they just repeat things that they hear and aren't doing their own investigation on their own. You know, it's shame on them. People, spend some time here. You know, but they just want, they just hear the sound bites. They hear the, 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 the few minutes of preaching or whatever that, oh, man, I can't believe you said that. Oh, that's terrible. You're so hateful. Look, we are balanced. We are a well-balanced church. I think it's a well-balanced group of people overall, collectively, that believe very similarly. Uh, if you go and, and go in and visit any of these churches or talk to any of the pastors, you're going to find it's very well-balanced. And you're going to find a lot of love, a lot of love. But you're also going to find preaching the whole counsel of God. Right. Here, to these priests at this time, and we're going to see a little bit more about them, a little bit more about their character, a little bit more about the thing that they're doing wrong. But he says, look, I'm going to send a curse upon you. He said, I've already cursed you. But I'm going to send this curse around you, uh, upon you. And look at verse number three, because this is very graphic language. But don't forget, this is the word of God, and this is scripture. Verse three says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. At someone else to just do something like that. You have to do something pretty bad, I think, to, to make someone angry enough to spread dung on your face. And that's a human being in the flesh. This is God speaking. This is God talking about spreading dung on the priest's face. Merciful, whose mercy endureth forever. Deciding, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm sick of you. I'm sick of you people not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're claiming my name. You're supposed to be in this position. You have this office, and you make me so sick, I just want to spread dung on your face. Solemn feasts. They're going through the motions and saying, oh, yeah, we have these solemn feasts and stuff, but their heart isn't in it. And they're not doing anything right. But they still continue to have this stuff. And he's like, to me, this stinks. The offerings and sacrifices unto the Lord are supposed to be for a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. It's supposed to be well-pleasing unto God when the priests would offer up these sacrifices and when the people would bring them in. And it is a sweet-smelling savor when everything's being done right. When everything's being done according to the word of the Lord, that's great. God loves that. But when they do everything wrong and they start going after false gods, but then they're still claiming the name of the Lord and they're still uh, uh, having these solemn feasts, he says, you know what it smells like to me? It smells like dung. And I'm going to rub your face in it. Way with it. Verse number four. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, to our Levi, of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. So the reason why I even picked Levi and why this is going, you know, my covenant has gone to the tribe of Levi is because he, Levi, you know, he feared my face. This is, this is where, and I also think there's a kind of a dual prophecy here with the Lord Jesus Christ as well, receiving a covenant, but I don't really want to get too far into that tonight. Um, there's, there's a lot of other content I actually want to get to, and there's, there's other correlative scriptures I want to read from as well. Um, but he says this in verse number 5, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. That fear of God, and, and this is the fear of God. He's like, this is why you're giving it to you. But now what's he making the point about? They've lost that fear. They don't have that fear of God anymore. They have their solemn feasts, but they don't have the fear of God because they're not doing anything right. They're not actually looking to the law for their guidance. They're kind of just making things up as they go. Verse number six says, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many 
away from iniquity. And that is the job of the priests, of the Levites, of the people who are serving God, of the people who are supposed to be speaking the law of truth. The law, I love that verse or that, that phrase, the law of truth. It's the word of God. The law of God is the law of truth. And this is what they're supposed to be teaching people, what they're supposed to be preaching, what they're supposed to be instructing people about. And if you do that, if you preach the law of truth, if you're diligent to preach the commandments of God, then you know what that's going to do? It's going to turn many away from iniquity, Amen. Yep. as it had in the past. Amen. He said, this is why I gave it to him, because he cared about me, he feared me, and he preached my name, and he preached my law. This is the truth, this is the right way, and it turns people away from iniquity. But when you neglect the law of God, when you want to start just preaching things out of your own heart, when you start just adding your own traditions and making them like the commandments of the Lord, now you've uh, abased the word of God, you abandon the word of God, and that's when your iniquity starts to abound. And instead of people turning from iniquity, they're, turning, they're, not, they're not turning from iniquity and continuing to sin. And we'll get into this a little bit more. I want to keep reading here. Verse number 7, the Bible says, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they, sh and they should seek the law at his mouth. This is the job for the priest. You're supposed to keep knowledge. You're supposed to seek the law at his mouth. And if you want to have a position of being a pastor or a teacher, being a religious or a spiritual leader in the church of God, keeping knowledge, you need to be interested in the things that come from God and sticking to that, sticking to the truth. Don't venture outside of that and get so far removed that you've just kind of left the Bible alone over there and you, you start doing your own thing with the crowd. And for human beings, they have a, a lot of people have a tendency to do this. It's, it's a sinful human nature, especially as churches grow and become more popular, right? To, for some people, that level of, of being in a position that's looked up to, that's regarded, starts going to people's heads. And especially over time, you could kind of, that, that tradition can get passed down or people can get too influenced into having the influence, into being that guy, into wearing the long robes, into getting the nice greetings at the marketplace, and the culture starts, people start looking to them and be like, oh yeah, I want to be that guy. It's, it's, it's a similar position to where people in the ghettos look to the drug dealers going, oh, I want to be like that guy who's got all the money and women and, and cars and fancy goods and stuff. That's what the, that's what the priests were turning into. who's well-respected and everybody likes them and gets all the best things and, and he walks into the market and, and he gets all the greetings and people are buying stuff for him and everything else. Look, that's all well and fine and people love you, but your job, O oh priest, is to have the integrity with the word of God and preach the law of truth. Whether or not people commend you doesn't matter. Whether you abound or whether you're abased, this is where your priority needs to be. And unfortunately, for some people, they shift. And even if they started off being right, they can shift to a point to where now they care more about all the other things. And they start to get away from the word of God because that's their new focus. But the focus needs to remain on keeping knowledge and seeking the law of his mouth. Seeking the law of his mouth doesn't ever stop, by the way. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been pastoring. I don't care about any of that. You always seek the law at his mouth. Amen. Always. And the moment you stop doing that, man, it's about time to, to hang it up and let someone else step in who is going to be seeking the law at his mouth. It's been a while since we had a preaching class, but I instruct a guy saying, you know, being able to prepare sermons does get easier with the more experience and knowledge that you have. And that's a fact. Okay, preparing sermons for me when I was younger or newer, especially at pastoring, took longer, more time. Hey, my knowledge base wasn't as much as it is today. And hopefully in 20 years, it'll be that much higher. 
because y'all should be growing and learning and developing more and more and getting better and, and just gaining more wisdom and knowledge. But don't ever think that you could get to a point where you just be like, well, that's, I don't even have to read the Bible anymore. That's a foolish thing to think. Well, I don't have to say, I just know, I know all this stuff. But, but here's the thing. You could get to a certain point to where writing sermons is easy. You if you stop caring, uh, caring about the quality, you stop caring about being able to, to know as much and convey as much and do as the best job that you can, Okay, now look, I'm speaking of things that maybe many of you don't, you, it's harder to connect with because you're not doing this job on a regular basis. Okay, but the temptations out there, I've spoken to one pastor who's no longer a pastor anymore, and they would confess to me that even in the midst of their sin, how they were able to just write all these sermons and everything else and do all this stuff, and it was so easy for them, and that just blew me away. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard that. I was just like, well, you, that is... I didn't, even, I didn't even have a response. I couldn't say anything. It was shocking. Looking to and pouring over these sermons to make sure, you got to make sure everything's right. You got to make sure what you're going to say is the truth. You got to you, you know, have that, that desire to preach truth, to seek the law of truth. And if you are someone that's out there that's interested in, in having that type of position, you want to be a pastor one day, you need that. You need that desire. And even if you don't, we all ought to have that desire anyways. To know, to be, to be consistent with God's word, to know it, to get the wisdom, and to love it, and to just want to know more of the truth. And never abandon that for any reason. But the children of Israel, and even the tribe of Judah, which is being discussed here, is, has just fallen away. They've apostatized. Okay? And this is, of course, the last book of the Old Testament before, the new, before Jesus Christ comes in. And you can see the spiritual condition of the nation when Jesus comes on the scene. Because all we're reading about is these Pharisees and Sadducees, and they're just a bunch of false prophets and a bunch of unsaved people and a bunch of people that just have made up essentially their own religion. Completely separate from the law of Moses, from the Bible, from the Lord, even though they claim all of those things. They have created a separate religion, which continues to this day. It's known as Judaism. Judaism isn't the original religion. It is spawned off of the original religion. It is an offshoot of a, of a not, not a child of, but, but got its, just like every false religion, has gotten its influence from the true religion, from the true God. That's why you seek how many, you know, people like to think, oh, well, why are the common else? It's because you're stealing from this religion. You know, look, the only people who are stealing are the people who are stealing from the truth. It's Satan who's trying to make a false religion look like the truth in every instance. Let's keep reading here. Um, priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Hey, priest, it's not, it's not your job to preach out of your own heart. You're the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You have to say what God says. You are just the messenger. And when you start making up your own message, that's when you got a problem. The message needs to be the message of the Lord. Amen. You are the messenger. And, and honestly, I don't know why you'd want it any other way except for maybe your pride. People's own pride likes to think, my message is giving me all this following and all this money and all this people and all this respect and everything else. That's pride. It doesn't matter what happens after that. It's actually, if you think about it, I don't want to say it's an easy job, but it's not a complicated job at all. But it is easy in this sense. No matter what happens, you could just say, all I'm doing is just being a messenger. That's it. 
So it's great. It, 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 it's, one, it's going to keep you humble when things abound, when everything's going really well and there's all this, this great blessing and people are getting on board and things are growing and the ministry's growing. Hey, I'm just being a messenger. I mean, nothing that's happened in this church is like, oh, because I'm such a great person. No, I'm just being a messenger to the Lord. And if I'm going to be a faithful messenger, God could bless and we can bring more people together and we can do great things. But then if things go bad and a bunch of people hate us, I could still say, hey, look, I'm just a messenger of the Lord. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't write the Bible, okay, but I'm going to preach it. But it makes it easier to, to preach the things that a bunch of other people don't like because your job is just to be the messenger. And oftentimes, they are hard pills to swallow. They are controversial. They are offensive. They are things that are going to cause people to be really angry and full of wrath because you've said them, but at the end of the day, you can say, look, I am the messenger of the Lord. Amen. And that's what every man of God ought to be able to say, I am a messenger of the Lord. And not like these phonies, I like to say, I have a message from the Lord, and then they just say anything, you know, things that are contrary to scripture. Uh, no, you didn't get that from the Lord, my friend. You got that out of your own heart. and be careful when you're listening to other people that want to use this, oh, I got a word from the Lord the other day. It's out there in abundance. Oh, yeah, God told me this. God told me that. I had one of my friends recently uh, outside of church, saved guy, tell me that, oh, yeah, God told me this and that. I'm not going to go into details. He, you know, he's a good guy. He's saved, but, but he told me something. I'm just like, God didn't tell you that. But when you're listening to certain preaching for a while, that mindset and that thought gets into your head, and then you start to think, oh, yeah, God just told me this one day. I'm like, God didn't tell you that. Amen. Did you hear a voice? Well, no, but, you know, it's like, well, look, man. You had a feeling. You had a feeling. But you can't attribute that feeling that God made you feel that way about something. And it's some, there was something that's like real close and personal to him and it's kind of sad because um, it was something that would be a blessing from God in his life. God didn't tell you that. Because what we see in the Bible is what God said. It's damaging. It leads people astray. These, these priests, right, or today, you know, pastors, spiritual leadership that's, that's going to get up and say these things and say them flippantly. Look, your words matter. They have meaning. What you say, it ne you need to measure it and make sure you're continuing to be the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And the only way you can be the messenger of the Lord of hosts is by saying what he said. But ye are departed out of the way. These priests, that's who he's speaking to, the priests. You're departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. You, you priests, you're supposed to be expounding the law. You're supposed to be explaining it and giving wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the law. And instead, you're making people stumble at the law. It's doing the exact opposite. So people want to get involved in this. As I said, it's so important because... You're supposed to be doing good, and if you do bad, then you're going to be doing that much more evil as opposed to if you just didn't do anything. Right? It would be a lot better for you not to do anything than to cause people to stumble at the law. Amen. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. And this is how a lot of false prophets are. They're partial in the law. They only like to speak those things that are in season. They only like to say the things that everyone can agree on and everyone likes and everyone enjoys and omit the other parts that nobody wants to hear. The part that's going to be a divisive or offensive, oh yeah, we'll leave that alone. They're partial. 
They become judges of the word of God, of the law of God, instead of just being the messenger. And God said, well, as a result of that, look, I've made you contemptible and base and low in the eyes of the people. You, you love the greetings. You love the accolades. Well, guess what? Now I brought you low. Because you brought my name low, because you're causing people to stumble at the law, now you're brought low. Being partial. Whether or not sodomite should be put to death, and saying, he, he literally tried to say that, that do I be pastors, which would I guess include myself, are not saved because we don't have the understanding of the story of the woman taken in adultery. That, that is the reason why we're not saved. First of all, really good measure of, of who's saved and who's not. Okay. A story in which, when you read it in context, it says the people were trying to catch him in his words. They're trying to make him go to jail. They're trying to stop his ministry with a question that they think he can't answer correctly no matter what he says. But my understanding, oh, you're just so way off that, I mean, you can't even be saved. Because... His understanding is when Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, the woman taking adultery, and they're trying to say like, hey, what should we do with her? Should we put her to death, huh? Lord Moses' law said we should put her to death. What should we do? So by Jesus saying to throw a stone at her, means that we no longer should have the death penalty for not just women taken in adultery, mind you, because... If you're going to take things consistently, I would think that if you're, going to, if you're going to take that away from that passage, how could you apply it any broader than that? But his claim was, well, no, murderers should still be put to death, but that's because murderers were put to death before the laws of Moses, see? Hmm. How do you get that out of the woman taken in adultery? That, well, no, we still do do capital crimes. We still do put people to death. But because he mentioned adultery and because that's part of the law of Moses, now we just, I guess there should not be, he just abolished what God's law should be, all the death penalty laws, except for those that were in effect before Moses gave the law. And I am the unsaved one. <laughs> now look, I don't think that this person's unsaved, but it boggles the mind of saying, how can you say that? It's someone who's being partial also in the law. Mm -hmm. To death. No, if you institute the law, you don't go back and kill everybody before it was a law. Yeah. You start enforcing the law after the law is put into effect. Dummies, I mean, seriously. Like, how is that so hard to understand? Well, then everyone would die. And it's like, well, did everyone die back in Israel? Did everybody die? They had the law. The law was supposed to be enforced. Now, I can't tell you how well it was enforced because we don't have a record of exactly how well they enforced God's law. Don't know. But God gave them that law, and I would think that at least for some time they enforced the law on putting people to death. I would hope so. Adulterers at that time. Mm -hmm. Stopped enforcing God's law at some point as adultery abounded and as sin got worse. Sure. <coughs> they don't want judgment. And as they turn from the Lord, of course, they start making up their own rules and their own laws. But that what get, what gets them into this state <laughs> to begin with. Where God's saying, I'm going to curse you. 
because you're not following my laws, because you're not seeking the law of truth, because you're not doing these things. All one Father hath not got one God created us. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Now, there's no way I'm going to get to everything I actually wanted to get to tonight. I realize this now as I'm only like halfway through this chapter, and I've got multiple other passages that I would like to turn to. But I'm at least going to start and throw some of this out there, even if I don't get to read everything else. There's a, passage, a, long, a lengthy passage in Isaiah and even a more lengthy passage in Jeremiah that both cover essentially the, like similar, if not the same things that are being brought up in this passage about the priests, but also about the sinful condition of Judah and this concept also of divorce and putting away and um, how God is going to deal with them. So here he is showing that Judah, the nation, has gone a whoring from God and they've, they've gone after this daughter of a strange God. So they're going and seeking, and, and basically what happens when the Bible warns about if the children of Israel were to, were to marry women of the heathen, that those women would turn their hearts away from serving the Lord. So by saying Judah is going after this daughter of the strange God, he's saying that your heart is being turned away unto these strange gods. You're being turned away from the Lord because you're going after these daughters. You're being married to these daughters of a strange God. And your heart's getting t turned away from me. And as a result, the Bible says, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar. Because you know, that's who the priests we're supposed to be these scholars and these masters of Israel and these, you know, intelligent people and well-versed in the Bible. He says, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. Because they're going after other gods. They've, they've completely destroyed the word of God. Verse number 13, and this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receiveth it with good will at your hand. It doesn't matter how much weeping, crying out, what type of production they make when they're making these sacrifices and offering these offerings, God's saying, I'm not accepting it at your hand at all. Verse 14, yet ye say, wherefore? And, and they're so oblivious to their own spiritual condition, they're just going like, well, why? Why, God? What's wrong? They've strayed so far that they, they can't even comprehend why they're in error. The Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did, he, and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. So he's speaking about a nation, and he's using terms of being, you know, the wife of your youth, which in the physical sense, right? People shouldn't be dealing with their wives, you know, as they get older, especially in years. Hey, don't deal poorly or treacherously by starting going after other women against the wife of your youth. You know, this, 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 this wife that you've been married with since you were both young, you've grown together, and now you're going after other women, right? Don't deal with your wife that way, with the wife of your youth. 
Similarly now, in a much grander time frame, because he's talking to a nation and he's talking about their spiritual espousal to the Lord, he's saying you're going after, now, hey, the wife of your youth is, you know, when you were seeking the Lord, when, 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 when the Lord brought you in and, and they were more righteous and pure in God's eyes and they, and they were starting off right and God had delivered them and God had saved them and, and they had the word of God and they were doing what's right and now all these years have passed and now they're just going after and seeking these other gods and dealing treacherously with the covenant that they were given. They were brought into this great covenant with the Lord and, you know, marriage is a covenant in itself. And now they're going and seeking after these other gods and they're dealing very treacherously. Yeah. So that's why he's saying, look, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Now, really quickly, I was going to go a little bit more in depth on this, but I'm not going to go too in depth on this. Malachi 2.16, when it says that God hateth putting away, yes, in the context, he's still talking about this greater um, spiritual truth about them go, you know, going away from God. But the fact that God hates putting away, it transcends any of the contexts, whether it's putting away of, uh, you know, spiritually speaking, with the, with the spiritual um, application of them leaving God, as well as the, the, the carnal physical sense within human marriage Amen. of putting away. That is also consistent in scripture. And people need, you know, it's funny how clear this is in the Bible. And turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19. This is so clear in the Bible Yet people want to cling and turn to these random verses. And I don't say random, but you call them obscure, random, whatever. But they, they like to take some verses out of context to try to say, oh, no, it's okay to get a divorce. And they give you these grounds for divorce. There is one circumstance where God allowed that. And we're going to read about that in Matthew chapter 19. Okay, Jesus clearly expounds the one case in which it was acceptable under the law of Moses to, to get a divorce. There was one circumstance. All these other reasons why you get a divorce, and they'll turn to, you know, 1 Corinthians 7, or they'll turn to um, Jeremiah, literally, Jeremiah chapter 3, or maybe a couple other places where it says that God divorces people, where God has divorced the nation. But look, God divorcing a nation is not, you know, him using that language of saying that he's basically turning the children of Israel into bondage and everything else as a result of their punishment and using the language of putting them away is not the same as giving the green light to saying, yep, now you can just get, get divorced for every reason. Right. Now it's okay. Oh, see, look, God's okay with that. Well, that's funny because if you're going to turn to a place like Jeremiah 3, which we won't tonight for sake of time, I think Matthew 19 happens after Jeremiah 3 in the chronology. I, I mean, I might be off a little bit, but I'm pretty sure that when Jesus was speaking, that he lived after Jeremiah the prophet. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? This should be an easy answer. Aren't you reading your Bible? Amen. Aren't you seeking the law of truth? Amen. Don't you know this already? Why are you asking me these foolish questions? Male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. <laughs> Haven't you read, going all the way back to the beginning, people, talk about Adam and Eve. God made men and women that they should come together, be one flesh, and they're married, and that's why they leave father and mother, is to go and be married and start their own family. And that's it. And then you're married and become one flesh. 
When God makes you one flesh, you're not, you're not, it's not designed to be divided, right. to be split apart, to be divorcing that one body. Right. So for this reason, because they, are, they twain shall be one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain. Hey, when you get married, you are no longer two. You are no longer two. Get married. There is foolishness that goes on oftentimes in marriages, early, especially early on in marriages. In people who get married, because look, that, that happens almost inevitably. Okay, when people get together and start living together, um, you have to get used to each other and, and whatever. So there's, there, you know, that's not abnormal to have friction. But what you need to make sure is not in your mind is a me versus them attitude. And what you need to be aware of is looking out for people who are going to say, I'm on your side versus their side. Amen. There are no sides when you're married. There's one side because you're one flesh, because you are one. Amen. ...side, and everyone else who's trying to pit one against the other is more interested in the divorcing side. Right. When God's saying, you're one. And, and watch out for that because Humanly, sinfully, naturally, the parents of each individual that gets married is going to want to be on their child's side when any problem happens. But you can't be reinforcing this concept of division when there's a problem within a marriage and thinking of things of being a side. You need to lose the concept of my side, their side. It's one. Mm -hmm. We need to be one and come together as one and not even listen to people who are going to tell me about don't let him do that and don't let her do that and, every, you know, and all this other stuff of like the, trying to divide you and I'm on your side and you're right and they're, you know, like, look. It doesn't, you know, and, and, and you know what else doesn't matter in a marriage? Who's right and wrong? need to be one and they're still an authority structure and God didn't say for the wife to obey the husband only when the husband's right that's why I say it doesn't matter who's right and wrong because there's an authority so when the authority says what well, the way things are going to be then that's the way things are going to be hard for a person to have a one-sided fight. Ang <laughs> angrily and going railing for railing when, when, when they're just the one who starts yelling and, every, you know, hey, if you don't respond, a bit of something to think about there. Back to the putting away. Okay, I, I'm getting too far off the subject here. Jesus said that they're no more twain, they're one flesh. Okay, when you get married, you're no, you're no longer two, you're one. And you need, to, you need to understand that, you're one. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God joined you together in marriage. So don't, no man should be dividing that. This was Jesus' answer to the question is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? This is, this is the answer. They don't like this. They say unto him, well, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? Now, Moses, first of all, didn't command to give her a writing of divorcement and put her away for every cause. 
which is kind of what they're implying here. He didn't. There is an allowance in the law if someone were to put a person away to have a bill of divorce. That is part of the law, but it's not a command to divorce. Yeah, right. There's a difference there. It's just like people, you know, oh, the Bible endorses slavery, endorses. Look, the law deals with things that happen in life. And the, and the law allows for some things and doesn't allow for some things. It doesn't mean it pr it's a promotion. Yeah, exactly. It's a way of dealing with things justly and appropriately. It's because of the hardness of your hearts. Now, is it, is it a good thing to have a hard heart, according to the scripture? I mean, like, is that just, yeah, I just want to have, it, you know, God's teaching you should have a really hard heart. No, it's not. But he recognizes that some people have really hard hearts. Situation with a marriage. Because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, which means allowed you, not commanded you, allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So, I, I, you know, this just, th just literally just popped in my head. So I wonder if that guy who's trying to say that Jesus changed how the Old Testament laws should be, you know, capital crimes should be committed. Well, this sounds like he's also abolishing that caveat for having a divorce because he says from the beginning it was not so. So God didn't allow it before. Well, Jesus is getting rid of stuff. It kind of sounds like he's getting rid of that here. If you, if you take that mindset, right? I'm not saying he's getting rid of that. What I'm saying is, hey, why don't you just apply everything equally and consistently? Why don't you have some consistency then in your doctrine? If you're going to say that, then how would you not apply this the same way? Start telling people now, yeah, there is absolutely no grounds for divorce. Because from the beginning it was not so. And this is what Jesus is telling the, the Pharisees that came to him. So obviously now there's no more ability to have any type of divorce. Get divorced. And divide asunder. <laughs> Say unto you, verse 9, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. That was the exception. And I'm not going to go too far into detail about that, but fornication is what happens um, prior to the union of uh, a, a man and a woman, when, whereafter it becomes adultery, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. So here's how God feels about divorce. It's how Jesus feels. It, it, we already read that God hates putting away. Jesus clarifies that a little bit more for us, I think, here, explaining a little bit more in depth as to why God hates putting away. Why? Because God has joined together two people and made them one flesh. Don't divide them asunder. Let's keep reading, though, in Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. I, like I said, I'm, I'm way, um, I know we're almost done with the verses here, but I do want to get to these other references and just point out some of the similarities here with these other references, even if it's quickly. Verse number 17, Malachi chapter 2. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Again, still speaking to the priest, the commandment for the priest. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? Now, you got to understand, when, when, when God's telling them that they're saying, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, he's not saying that they're literally saying like in front of people, everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. That's not what they were saying. It's not what he's accusing them of. What he's accusing them of is saying that people who are doing evil are good in the sight of the Lord and that God's delighting in them. So people who are doing wicked things, it's excusing their sin and basically making the law of God of none effect by saying, oh no, these people are great. God loves these people. Boy, this sounds just so, 
Just so applicable today for some reason. Some things there, I, I, I can't really put my finger on it. Of people who might be doing something like this, of, of saying that God delights in people that do evil. But what is it? What is the big thing today that people are just saying there's no problem with it at all? And I don't know. Maybe it'll come to me later. Let's go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 5. I want to bring out some of these other points. that God has over the priests and over his, you know, his people that do this, this isn't just mentioned this one time. This is brought up multiple times in the Bible, and God is always very angry when his people who are supposed to be teaching the truth get, into, get, get so far removed that they start calling the evil good. And the evil people, oh no, they're good. Oh, there's nothing wrong with those people. And everyone's welcome. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They put everything on its head. Everything's in reverse. Boy, I wonder who, that, who might be behind that of making everything the opposite. Maybe the father of lies? He's behind all, he wants to turn everything upside down. Good is evil, evil is good. Satan is God, God is Satan. It's satanic. That's, that's, what, that's what the devil wants. He wants to be seen as God. And he wants God to look like the bad guy. Them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Yet yeah, these aren't the messengers of God. They're just wise in their own eyes. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward. Now, why would someone do that? Because they don't have integrity. They don't care at all about what's right or what's wrong. They just care about themselves and they care about getting paid. So they could be bought off, they could be bribed, and they can just give you whatever judgment they want because you're going to give me money. And this is every corporation out there that's flying the rainbow flag during the month of June on their Facebook page and on their social media. They justify the wicked for reward because they think it's going to get them more money. It's the only reason why they do it. By wicked people themselves. Usually it's just because, you know, they don't care about the cause. They just care about money. They justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And that's when we start condemning the righteous man who's trying to say, no, look, this is wickedness. We shouldn't be for this. No one should be endorsing this. That's wicked. And then they'll start calling that guy evil. Oh, you're the hateful one. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, so, so now we're going to see God's anger as a result of those that call evil good and good evil. How does God feel about this? Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, the, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And these warnings in Malachi, in Isaiah 5, and in Jeremiah 23, which is the last place we're going to look at tonight, Jeremiah 23, all of these places, it's God's people. God's people. Look, God's people, 
Don't start falling in line with the world, with the satanic agenda of calling good evil and evil good. that are going to have integrity of heart and service to God and decide, I'm going to be a messenger of God. I am going to stand on his word, and I am going to just preach all of it as it stands, as it's stated, as true as I possibly can be with my understanding of what the scripture is literally saying, and I'm going to say all of that, and I'm just going to be the messenger for the Lord. Include making applications to your current society, to your current culture, to your current environment. But you're still teaching what the word says. Every last bit of it. And making all the applications and connecting the dots that need to be made to help people see, wow, that really is just like what the Bible is saying here. It's intentionally left broad, those that call evil good and good evil, instead of being super specific about what specifically the priests were saying exactly at that time, because it could be applied to anything that's good and evil throughout time. And we could all relate to this and be like, yeah, there's people who are doing these wicked things, and these pastors or these preachers are saying, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. They're good. Oh, they're good people. You just got to get to know them a little bit. No, thank you. No, they're not going to. Look at verse number one. We're going to read through this really quickly. I, I'm, I'm out of time, but I, want, I, I do want to just make sure we get through some of this. So I'm going to almost speed read through this so you can follow along, maybe read a little bit more in depth later. Woe be, verse number one, unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Woe unto them. It's the same type of person, same type of message, same type of people. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away. Just like the Bible said in Malachi, you're causing them to stumble at my law. Because they're not teaching them what's right. They're confusing them and teaching them falsehoods. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Good prophecies are going to prophesy about Jesus Christ coming. Jump down to verse number 9. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. And their course is evil and their force is not right. See, God is cursing the people here also. He's saying, hey, land's full of adulterers, and guess what? Now the wilderness all dried up. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They have prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. It's been going on throughout history. This was going on in Jeremiah's day, in Isaiah's day, before they were taken captive. Okay? Malachi happens after that. It still is going on. You would think that people would get through, but no. These, these patterns repeat throughout history. They're repeating today. Amen. We need to gain the wisdom of all the records of this and how God feels about this and not get caught up in any of the false prophets that have their false visions and falsely say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not said. And their message is always the one of everything's good, everything's great, God loves us, God loves you, God loves everybody, God's with us, no one's against us. It's always been the message of the false prophet, always. Amen. 
the negative thing ever because everyone loves to hear the good news, the positive only. I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery. The prophets committing adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers. That none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. They're doing the exact opposite of what their job is to do. Instead of deflating the hand of the evildoer, of the wicked people, and, and causing them to be in shame, and causing them to turn from their wicked ways, instead they're strengthening their hands and making them even more bold. And, you know, we're so hateful and we're so bad over, you know, people who are living extremely wicked lifestyles, and they're just emboldening them. Yeah, go on, just, just, just love everyone. Tell, tell everybody that everything's just great and you're great and you're wonderful and tell them how much God loves them and see where that gets you. Because I think we're reading from the Bible that God hates that they're doing that, Amen. that God hates that his people were doing these things and that God's telling them not to do these things and that you're not supposed to be strengthening the hand of the evildoers. And that now you're just like Sodom and Gomorrah. I will feed them with wormwood. Wormwood's like poison. It's of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Yeah, go ahead and do whatever you want, anything that comes out of your heart, and you'll be just fine. No evil's going to come upon you. That's what the false prophet says. That's what these wicked prophets are saying, and God is so angry about. That's their message. So when you start hearing people saying things like that, run the other direction. Don't buy into their lies and their falsehoods. His word. Who hath marked his word and heard it? Verse 19, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it perfectly. This is the message of God. This is the true method, message. This is the thus saith the Lord. It's not the everyone's okay. It's that God's angry with the wicked every day. Amen. Yep. Prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. And just because someone's claiming the name of the Lord and preaching and they're full of lies and hypocrisy, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that they're of God. And it doesn't mean that people should just abandon religion altogether because some people are bad and they do things that God said not to do. Because they do so much damage that God gets so angry and that God brings the destruction that he brings. Verse 22, but if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, if they had done their job, if they had made the people hear my words, not their imagination out of their own heart, but what I told them to preach, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. That is the purpose. That is the intent. It's the same message, book after book, prophet of God after prophet of God teaching this and rebuking and saying this is what needs to be done. Amen. Yeah. Scratch the itch in your ear and tell you what you want to hear and prophesy smooth things. They're always rebuked in the scripture. We see this re rebuke in Malachi chapter 2. And I, like the whole book is a rebuke of Malachi before Christ comes.
people, believers, to read the Bible themselves. You cannot uh, over. Uh, it's it's so abundant in Scripture. You can't overlook this. Even newer believers, which I understand, sometimes Scripture is harder to understand as you're going through it. Maybe the first time or second time, it's 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 hard to take everything in. You still cannot get past the wrath of God and all the negative preaching that exists in the Bible, it's like you, you can't come away thinking that that's not there. Positive stuff, because that's all there too. But if you actually read your Bible sincerely, you read this stuff, you, you're going you're gonna to know that what I'm saying is true. Amen. It's there. Amen. And God wants the righteousness, and he wants the obedience, and he wants people respecting him and fearing him and looking to the law of truth. Making up their own stuff, especially when they claim the name of the Lord. Who are actually going to have the care for the word of God to, one, change their life, first of all, to be consistent with this book, and then two, after that, to desire to become a teacher and a preacher of the Word of God, and to continue to help other people by being the messenger of the Lord and preaching the Word of the Lord. Be full of lazy people. We don't stop. Nevertheless, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 From tonight's sermon, but I'll tell you what, if nothing else, I hope it just inspires you to get in the word of God and just make sure you have that integrity with what the Bible says, no matter what it is. And love it, every word of it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you so much for the instruction that you give us. We thank you so much for the, the people that you've raised up that are um, willing to just be your messenger and to preach your word. Lord, I praise you. Please help me to be a better messenger, to not um, say anything that would be false or, or help, and help me to understand the areas where I'm an error, dear Lord, um, with your word so that I can do a better job of, of teaching and instructing. And Lord, just help all of us to continue to grow in our wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And, and Lord, I just pray that you would please bring uh, the destruction that you talk about upon those wicked false prophets that are out there to deceive and that are out there confusing people and that are out there doing these wicked things. And Lord, I pray that you would please just help bring more people together that are going to uh, love you and serve you, that we can um, just magnify your word for what it says to, to the utmost, Lord, as much as we possibly can. Help us to do that in this church. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.